Hello everybody, it's me, Mr. Tall23, back with another video. In this video, I would like to revisit the concept of liberty and freedom in Christ and see what the scriptures actually teach concerning the subject. Now, there's a lot of deception amongst Christians today who misunderstand the biblical concept of liberty and who twist the word as it appears in scripture to support their own ungodliness and disobedience to the Bible. Another phrase I want to briefly touch on in this video is under the law. Uh, these same deceived Christians say, well, we're not under the law, but under grace, and we have freedom in Christ, so you can't tell us how to live. So the Bible can't tell us how to live. The law is done away with. That's old. We don't need that anymore. And that's the attitude that a lot of people have today. There are many Christians also who get their view of liberty from American ideals. Those who live in the United States, of course, have a very strong heritage of the idea of liberty and freedom. Many Christians are libertarians who believe in a very limited government and who do not believe there should be laws against certain activities which they believe to be uh, just up to personal choice. Now, over two years ago, I made a video explaining why Christianity and libertarianism are incompatible, showing from the scriptures that what is taught in the Bible is in essence contradictory to much of what libertarians say and much of what their beliefs are. Okay, I recommend going and watching that video. Uh, since then, I've changed a little bit on some of my beliefs, but the uh, general idea and the points that I make in the video still hold, and it still shows you the uh, the foolishness of the American concept of, of liberty and libertarianism. We need to understand what true biblical liberty is, the liberty which God gives us, and to put to rest the unbiblical idea that because we are saved by grace and have freedom in Christ, we are of no obligation to serve or obey God's commandments or to do that which is right. That is not what liberty means in the Bible. I will also show you examples of how American Christians are having their views corrupted by our society and would rather side with the agnostic and deistic uh, Masonic anti-Christian founding fathers than with the word of God. Firstly, in the New Testament, what do the scriptures say that we are made free from? Okay. There's no doubt that the Bible talks a lot about being made free and having liberty, but what is our Christian liberty? What have we been made free from? Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 32 to 36, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So Jesus teaches that those who commit sin are the servants of sin, but through knowing the truth, the truth shall make us free. Jesus said both thy word is truth in John seventeen seventeen, and he also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, verse 6. So through knowing Jesus and hearing his word and believing in them, we can be made free, and this freedom of which we are made free is freedom from the captivity unto sin. Before we got saved, we were under bondage, we were under captivity, we were a servant to the lusts of our flesh. However, since the Son abideth forever, as Jesus teaches in this passage, as said in verse 35, when we are redeemed by him, we are truly made free. We are no longer in this servitude or in this captivity to our sin. Now, why is that? Well, because according to the scriptures, when we are saved, the scriptures teach that our spirit is born of God. The Bible says, as many as received him, uh, that would be uh, those who receive the truth. It says, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, verses 12 to 13. So through believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, we become the sons of God and are born of God according to the Bible. What this entails is stated very clearly in 1 John 3, 9, where it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. See, the new creature created within us, this new spirit uh, that's within us, is without sin according to the Bible. And therefore, the Bible teaches that the new man the spirit, not the flesh, because our flesh can still sin, but the spirit that has been born of God cannot commit sin. Back in John chapter 8, Jesus said that whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. 
However, since the new man, since the new creature that's born of God cannot commit sin, according to 1 John 3, 9, it's therefore no longer the servant of sin. It has been made free. He has redeemed us through regeneration. Now, a very important and well-developed passage discussing our liberty in Christ, uh, that would be our freedom from sin, is in Romans chapter 6. It says in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So in being crucified with Christ on the cross, we are putting our old man away. And it symbolizes that our flesh has been defeated, it's been destroyed. So that henceforth, meaning from now on, we should not serve sin. Remember, our captivity in the past was being a servant to sin, according to uh, John 8, uh, 34. Jesus Christ, uh, as, uh, but through Jesus Christ, as it says here in verse 7 of Romans 6, uh, that he that is dead is free from sin. So when we die with Christ, we are made free from sin. He has made us free. But that's not the end of the story. The scriptures go on to say in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 to 22, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So when we are made free from sin through our death with Christ, as a Christian, we are free from the bondage to sin. But, as stated in uh, verse 18, we are now made the servants of righteousness. So we were the servants of sin, that's past tense, in verse 17. But because we obeyed from the heart the form of the doctrine that was delivered us, uh, that is that we believe the gospel. Through faith in the gospel, we are saved, we are redeemed from sin. But as stated here, this freedom is not freedom from any kind of service. It's not just freedom to live however you want. Now we have been made the servants of righteousness, as it says. And then in verse 22, it says that also that when we are made free from sin, we become the servants to God. So as a Christian, sin is no longer our master, but God is. And we are commanded to serve him in righteousness. This, of course, is a freedom for our soul, but because our flesh has not changed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our flesh has not been born again at our salvation, the scriptures teach that we must make the effort to yield our members, which would be our, our body, or the parts of our body, to righteousness in order to be proper servants. Uh, notice in verse 16 of this passage that it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now that ties in with what Jesus said in John chapter 8, that if you commit sin, you're the servant of sin, right? So if your flesh continues to serve sin, okay, your body is not being yielded to God, but it's rather still a servant to sin. Okay? Uh, in Romans chapter 7, it teaches that as well. It talks about how I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity unto the law of sin which is in my members, okay? If you are not walking in the spirit, but you're allowing your flesh to control you, and you're following the lust of the flesh and getting into sin, then according to the Bible, you are bringing yourself back under captivity. Not your, your born-again spirit, which cannot commit sin, but your body, your flesh, is under captivity to sin every time it commits sin, okay? Therefore, it says in verse 19, as ye have, this is a command, as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, and to iniquity. So that's past tense. Even so now, so, so this is what you need to do now that you are a Christian, now that you have been made free from sin, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. It's a command saying that in time past, ye yielded your members to uncleanness and to iniquity. 
but now you must yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. Uh, earlier in the chapter, it also states, uh, it says, not, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. It's teaching you, don't let sin reign within you. Don't obey sin. Don't bring yourself under that captivity again. So being made free does not mean we can live forever we want and continue in sin. That's not what that means at all. We are made the servants of righteousness. Liberty is not the freedom to do whatever we want, but rather the freedom to live righteously, the freedom to serve God, which we could not properly do before because our spirit was subject to sin. Our spirit was not born again. Okay, we did not have the spirit of God within us. Now that we do have that Holy Spirit, we have that freedom, the power to live as servants of God in righteousness. As it says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that liberty is not the liberty to live how we want to live and to live however we want. This is not the freedom from observance of the commandments of God, as many false teachers say today. They ignore the many warnings in the scriptures concerning our sin and use freedom and grace as an excuse to live in the manner that they want to live, to live in sin. It says in 1 Peter 2, 15 and 16, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So our liberty, therefore, is not a complete liberty. It's not a freedom from any service or any servitude, but rather it is the free choice now to serve God. That is what Christian liberty is. That is God's liberty. That is what the Bible talks about. We are commanded not to use our freedom as a cloak of maliciousness. The word cloak means a cover. There are a lot of people who use their liberty as a cloak or a cover for their sins, saying, well, I'm free in Christ, according to the Bible, so you can't judge me by the way that I live. Or they say, well, I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace, and they will use that as a cloak for their maliciousness or a cloak for other sins as well. And they fail to understand what that phrase means, not under the law, but under grace. Uh, Romans chapter 6 asks that question, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? And the answer in verse uh, 15 is, God forbid. So not being under the law does not mean that we are not expected and obligated to keep God's commandments. Not being under the law means we do not seek to be justified by the law and therefore will not be judged and condemned according to that law. Look up every time the phrase under the law is used in the Bible. It refers to the unsaved, such as in Galatians 3.23. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. The fact that we are under grace and not under the law simply means that now we have been justified by grace through faith, and now the Lord will not judge us according to the law and according to our works, like he shall do for all the damned at the great white throne judgment uh, in Revelation 20, verses 12 to 15 and, and 21, verse 8. Okay, They have not received the grace of God. They have not been saved. They have not had their sins forgiven. Therefore, they will be condemned according to their sins. They will be judged according to that law. Uh, John 5, verse 45, Jesus said to the Jews, he said, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses. He's saying, okay, be, or it says, even Moses in whom you trust. He's saying, because you trust in the law, because you think that you're going to be just, because you're going to be righteous uh, before God because uh, of, of the law of Moses, he says that Moses will accuse you to the Father. They were under the law. They are going to be condemned because they do not have God's grace. So before we got saved, we sought to be justified by our own righteousness, by our own works, by the law, and therefore would be judged according to the law, but now we are under grace. It says in Romans uh, 2.12, uh, it says that as many as are without law shall also per perish without law, and as many are, as are under the law shall also be judged by the law, okay? So those who are under the law, those who seek to be justified by the law, they will be judged according to that, as Jesus teaches in John 5.45 to the Jews. So it has nothing to do with how we live our Christian lives. It has nothing to do with what happens after salvation, but it has to do with our salvation itself. The book of Romans clearly states also, Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. See, now that we are under grace, 
through faith in Christ, the Bible says we are not under the law. There's no debate about that, or, or not under the schoolmaster. It says in Galatians 3.25, the schoolmaster being the law. Yet at the same time, it makes it very clear this does not mean that the law is abolished. Okay? Not being under the law does not mean we don't have an obligation as Christians in our daily lives to obey God's commandments. That's not what that means at all. This does not mean we can sin and have no obligation to serve the Lord. That's not what those phrases mean. And God makes it very clear. Uh, he sets aside those verses in Romans 3 where it says we establish the law. And then Romans 6 where it says we, we won't continue in sin because we're not under the law. Okay, So for those who misunderstand, the Bible still makes it clear. Yes, the law is still uh, applicable for us Christians today. You can't just ignore the Old Testament because you don't like it. Okay? That's not what under the law means. So... Our freedom and the fact that we are not under the law should not be an excuse to live in the flesh. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So liberty should not be an occasion or an excuse to get into the flesh, to walk in the flesh, but rather we are commanded also to serve one another. So, there are three types of service we do as Christians that we've seen so far. Uh, to righteousness, according to Romans 6, and to God, uh, and then also to others, as stated in Galatians 5 here. So freedom is just a freedom from the bondage to sin. That's what Christian freedom, Christian liberty is. However, if you let your flesh take control of your life, you are bringing yourself back under bondage again. Remember what's stated in Romans chapter 6. Of course, since the new man cannot commit sin, according to 1 John 3, 9, uh, the new creature is not subject, but your body will be. That is why we are told constantly to put off the old man and to walk in the spirit. Okay, It says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then it names all the works of the flesh. It talks about fornication and drunkenness and adultery and lasciviousness and revelings and murder and all these things. Okay, It's not, well, I'm free in Christ, so I can do all these things freely. No. Freedom in Christ means freedom from sin. If you do those things, you're bringing yourself back under bondage. Okay? Freedom, from Christ, freedom in Christ should be the freedom to live righteously, to do that which is right, not to just live however you want and to go and disobey God's commandments. That's not what that means. So there are a lot of false teachers out there, however, who sound good because they come under the guise of teaching grace, and they might teach the right gospel, uh, but many fall into their trap unaware that they are using grace as an excuse for their wickedness. Okay, Many in the hyper-grace movement are like this. Now the scriptures warn of people like this in Jude chapter 1 verse 4. It says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there are certain people who use the excuse of God's grace to commit wicked sin, okay? And it's not that they truly believe. It says that they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are just using grace as kind of a cover, a cloak for their maliciousness, that they're actually wicked people. They don't care about the Lord. They don't believe on the Lord. They're just using it as a way to basically excuse their sin. Now, here it speaks specifically of lasciviousness. That would be lewdness or whoredom, fornication, uncontrolled sexual behavior. People say that they're under grace and not under the law and use that as a reason for why you can't rebuke them for fornication. These people, according to Jude, are ungodly men uh, crept in unawares. They're ordained to condemnation. These are reprobate false prophets who in reality deny the Lord, but they creep in unawares into the church, into our ranks, in order to pervert us with lies and lead Christians astray from the truth, lead Christians into wickedness. These people the scriptures warn us about, uh, see Second Peter chapter 2 as well, it also warns us about these same false prophets, which it says bring in damnable heresies. And there are many out there in the hyper-grace movement who fit this description, many non-denominational, liberal, worldly, new age type pastors who claim the name of Christ, but in reality pervert the scriptures to use it as an excuse for why they could be an adulterer and a fornicator and a disgusting, lewd person. People even use grace as an excuse for homosexuality and other wicked things of that nature. 
when false prophets creep into churches today and they, they molest people, they take advantage of people, then other pastors will come to their defense, not realizing that that person is only there for their own gain and not because they love God. It's wicked and it's terrible, and yet it happens. There are many Christians who are deceived today who think that we can just live however we want. Okay, And this is where the false philosophies of liberties of liberty is leading us, not just in churches but in our society as well. Uh, the ideals of American liberty and libertarianism are a plague where people stand up more for what they deem as right according to their constitution than what God has commanded, even Christians. Christians say that they can do certain wicked things uh, the Bible teaches against simply because it's not against the law of the land. Okay, there are some people who claim to be Christians who defend abortion, who defend homosexuality, and defend uh, 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 trans people, and defend all kinds of wicked things because they say, well, it's not against the law in the United States, so it's fine. Okay, It's not against the Constitution, so it's fine. But who cares? Okay, We're Christians. This is what we should be following, the Bible, not man's philosophies and man's ideas. And I already gave the example of lasciviousness, and that is particularly, of course, talking about within the local church, with uh, within Christianity, people creeping in unawares. But it's also just in our society as well about how people are just excusing sin and not preaching hard against them. There's liberal Christians who are just don't care anymore. Okay, You go to a lot of churches out there and the, the, the congregation's filled with fornicators and the pastor, because the pastor never preaches against it, he says we're free in Christ, we're not under the law. That means we don't have an obligation to obey the Old Testament. It's all just about love and mercy and, and that's it and there's nothing else. And that's all they talk about. Okay, and because of that, they're leading people astray, leading people into wicked sin like lasciviousness. Okay, people in this nation teach that we have the right to fornicate and commit adultery because it's not against the law. Well, it should be. If it were a righteous nation which actually followed God's law, and the Bible says in uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. So if it was a righteous nation, then adultery would be illegal, sodomy would be illegal. All of it would be illegal as it once was. Okay, I don't. I, I was about to go off on a rabbit trail there, but uh, I'm not going to. I'm just going to quickly say that you know, society used to be different. Just because it's this way right now at this particular time doesn't mean it was like that even a hundred years ago. Okay, all these things were illegal a hundred, a hundred fifty, two hundred years ago. Some of them were punishable by death that long ago not just in the United States, but many countries all throughout the world, okay? It's just this modern society within the last 50, 60, 70 years that excuses this stuff, just the last few generations, okay? But if most people throughout history have actually followed the teachings of the Bible and realized that the Bible says these things are wrong, so we're going to uh, make legislation against it instead of just saying, well... You have the liberty to live however you want and going with these wicked, uh, damnable, enlightenment philosophies. But I also want to give another example besides lasciviousness of how uh, the false understanding of liberty is perverting the minds of Christians. And this is just one example. I could go on with a bunch of ideas, but I don't want to talk forever. So I'm just going to give one other example uh, for something that people say we have the right to do and... We have the freedom to do because of our American ideals, but which contradicts the Bible. And this example might not be something that a lot of Christians like to hear, but I don't care because it's in the Bible. It's true. And that is that we have the so-called right to the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech is not biblical, and I'm about to show that to you. And I could go, like I said, I could go on with many, many other examples, but I just want to use this one example. And many Christians, upon hearing that, uh, the, especially the patriot flag worshipers out there, they might get upset. But the Bible says, this is the Bible, okay? Remember, the law of the Lord is perfect, according to the scriptures. The Bible says the commandment is holy and just and good. So it says in Exodus 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 21, verse 17, And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. 
Exodus 22, verse 28, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. And the word gods there is not talking about like false deities, but sometimes the word the Bible uses the word God to refer, like little g, to refer to uh, just human judges and rulers over the people. So it's basically saying, don't revile or curse those that rule over you. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, let your woman or let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. First Timothy two twelve. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And then Ephesians four twenty nine. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So, do we have the right to the freedom of speech according to the Bible? Can anybody just speak whatever they want, whenever they want? No. Well, we have a constitutional right to do it. You know, you can't make laws against it. Well, God did. God doesn't care about James Madison, okay? God doesn't care about the Founding Fathers. They're, most of them were wicked, God-hating reprobates who are in hell right now. We don't have a biblical right to do these things. We don't have a biblical right to just say whatever we want, whenever we want, okay, without any restriction. My God is the Lord. My God is not James Madison. And Christians ought to start acting like the Lord is their God, too, and stop putting uh, their, their wicked Enlightenment philosophies created by Bible-hating Freemasons over what the Bible says. I'm sick of hearing people saying stuff like, well, our Bill of Rights was, was based off of biblical principles, and, you know, it's a Christian nation. Well, some of it was, okay? Some of it was based on biblical principles. There are some things in the Bill of Rights that I agree with because they line up with the scriptures. But a lot of it also, like the freedom of speech, for example, is not. It implies by saying that Congress cannot make a law to infringe upon our right to the freedom of speech that we have that right to the freedom of speech and that Congress cannot institute biblical law either. Okay, so basically in writing that, it's saying, well, we have the right to say whatever we want, and the government can't change that. Well, God instituted a government that said, this is the law, okay? This is what you can't do. You can't curse your father or mother. You can't blaspheme God. You can't uh, uh, revile the rulers. You can't do any of this. And Christian patriots use that... Uh, use that uh, in the First Amendment to justify speaking about whatever they want, and then they, they cr criticize them, when uh, criticize us, and they say, well, I'm in a free country, and we're under the law, and stop judging, and things like that. But the Scriptures command us not to blaspheme. The Scriptures tell us not to curse our father and mother. The Scriptures tell us not to revile our leaders. The Scriptures tell us that women should speak, or should not speak at all, in the churches. The scriptures tell us not to speak corrupt communication. It sounds like our speech is limited. It sounds like the things that we can and can't say are limited because our freedom in the Bible is just freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. It's not freedom from God. It's not freedom from the law. It is freedom from sin. So stop turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and into other wicked forms of of sin. Stop using it as an excuse to, to blaspheme and to commit adultery and to have an abortion and to do drugs. That's another thing that the Bible is against alcohol as well. And they're like, well, we should just have a very limited form where certain things aren't against the law and only, you know, only murder should be against the law and stealing and, and things like that. Things where you're actually harming somebody. Uh, and that's what they say. But that's not what the scriptures teach. So let's just follow the Bible instead of following man's philosophies and just believe what the Bible says. We have freedom from sin, but God commands us and expects us to live righteously now as Christians. Okay? We need to put off our flesh and live according to the commandments and the principles of the Holy Bible and not live according to what our society says is right and wrong but live according to what God says is right and wrong. If you don't, you don't love God because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3 also says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. If you do not keep his commandments according to the Bible, you do not love God. So these people out there who try to justify their sin with these phrases, these cute little phrases like, 
well, I'm free in Christ or stop judging and things like that, where they'll take a phrase in the Bible out of context and they'll twist it to, to their own, uh, uh, to fit their own perversion. Okay. Stop saying those things. Just follow God and obey his commandments. Okay. Love God. Do what is right. Okay. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. God bless you and goodbye.